<laughs> okay, well, this is a this is a um, a presentation I gave at ESUG in 2011. It's about J Wars, which is the joint warfare system. I have this old brochure I'll pass around. You can look at it, but I'd like to have that back. Okay, um, J Wars was. was <clears throat> mandated by Congress in the mid-90s because basically each service had its own model. The, the Army's model said we need more tanks. The Air Force's model said we and Congress got tired of this, so they said build a joint model. So they wanted to have a multi-sided model where you could play not only red but blue, and they wanted to have each theater, I mean each each service represented. For instance, in, in the Navy's model, you know, the ground force is just kind of you know over there. That's not really important. So and they also wanted to use C4 and ISR. C4 is command control and two others. And ISR, ISR is um, basically sensing. So it was going to be a model where you weren't going to cheat. The airplanes were going to fly out. If it was a fo foggy day, you didn't see the target, and you might not be able to hit it. So it was going to try to be realistic. And you wanted to, to evaluate, um, you know, do you have enough forces to, to perform the, um, the missions that the political leaders might assign you. Courses of action are how you might invade Korea, stuff like that. And then trade-offs. For example. For example. I didn't say North Korea. <laughs> and then trade-offs, you know, is the F-18 as effective as the F-35? And the answer is no. Okay, so j -Wars was different from others' models. It was a, it was a, a closed forum. There was no man in the loop. A lot of the the other models would have a guy sitting there, you know, moving the pieces around on the board and stuff like that. Or you'd have what <laughs> what they would call a, a bog sat. A bog sat is a bunch of guys sitting around a table and <laughs> deciding what happens. So it's not very scientific. Uh, other models were deterministic. J Wars was stochastic. Typically, you'd do 30 runs of a scenario, throw out the outliers, and the stuff that was in the middle would be would be representative. Uh, and like I said, it's perception based. It was sensors, and you, we modeled the uncertainty of what you see. Uh, the model wasn't scripted, uh, it, but it acted on what it saw. So it might not know what a T-72 tank is. It might, might know that it's a tracked vehicle versus a wheeled vehicle, stuff like that. Yeah. In other words, we don't cheat. Statistics, 15 years, a lot of people, $100 million. Couple million lines of code, about four and a half lines of code per method, except for JW Relational Data Converter, which had 1,900 methods and 17,000 lines of code to talk to Oracle. So uh, we had a government directory, had civilian project management, and then we had five teams: land, air and space, maritime, logistics, and C4ISR, which is basically the, the, sen the sensing domain. And then we had a simulation domain, which I'll talk about, which handled things like database and terrain, things like that. No dedicated testing team. Every programmer was supposed to test his own stuff. We all know how well that works out. <laughs> okay. This is, uh, you've probably also heard of OODA. It was, the idea of OODA um, was popularized by a, an army colonel in the, in the 50s. And the idea is that <clears throat> you start out with your friendly perception. This is the... The blue over here, oops, and then you decide based on your plan, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep on your plan or are you going to change your plan? And the idea is if you can get inside this decision loop faster than your enemy can, you're going to win. It's basically a reaction. Yeah. Um, this is a kind of a wacky slide, but it shows the different domains. We'd have the platform, which has the entity models, um, and you have these, these managers. <clears throat> the simulation manager would control time. The interaction manager would say, when do I see you? You'd have an environmental manager, which would do weather and things like that. Uh, the movement, spatial. I'll talk more about this later. And then we had, uh, anyway, that's not the world's greatest slide. but Okay, the fundamental thing in J Wars was called a battle space entity. entity. It's basically anything you can shoot or be shot at. So it would be not only tanks and planes, but buildings, because they can be shot, targets. Um, BSEs have assets. So you'd have fuel, ammo, personnel, trucks, and assets would have on-hand and authorized levels. So you might say, I need to, I need to have uh, 
12 missiles. If I fall below six, I need to go for, I need to call logistics for resupply. Uh, yeah, I just said that. Okay, and your capabilities depend on your on your assets. So if you have an air base without that whose runways get killed, you can't conduct flight operations. Um, we also model planes crashing when they run out of gas, and land units can be attrited to where they're they're just not effective anymore. Some of the, some of the modeling did magic gas and resupply, but we thought that was kind of cheating. The services hated J-Wars. They hated J. They still hate J-Wars. They still hate J-Wars. Um, there was outside. It was basically competition of their own models. They knew how to fiddle their own models. You couldn't cheat in J-Wars without leaving fingerprints. Um, the Navy especially hated it because in some of our scenarios we sunk a carrier. And they did not want to hear that. So, and these were the. Was it legitimate though? We, well, it was. It was the result of the, of the scenario running the scenario. It happened. They sailed in harm's way, and they got the crap blown out of them. Yeah. So they deserved it. Yeah. So these were the sticks that they used to beat J Wars with. You know, why isn't in Java? Blah blah blah. You know. It ran much faster than other models. Storm was its major major competition. It was completely text based, and it took thirty hours to do run one. J Wars would do th uh, thirty in about three hours. But, um, so. JWARS, the funding was cut 50% in 2007, and then the main office was closed in, in 2007 on about 30 days' notice. And um, 25 people, including me, were laid off. It was in limbo for about a year until it was uh, taken over by um, JFCOM down in Virginia Beach. And uh, I was one of the staff of four <laughs> that maintained this af afterwards. It got canceled for good at the end of 2010 even though it was only costing the government about 800K a year. One of the reasons why is that the civilian head of OSD CAPE, which was the organization that owned um, Jazz, was a former Navy analyst and her deputy was a Navy admiral. Just a coincidence. Okay, lessons learned if we were gonna do it again. Um, we didn't do a very good job of managing customer expectations. Uh, JWARS was known as the PowerPoint model for a long time. It took us a, several years to just build the, the infrastructure to, to get anything going. Um, several of the IPTs, I won't name which ones, tended to overpromise and underdeliver because they used waterfall methodology. We're always going for the gold ring and we're terribly, terribly late. The maritime IPT always made its promises. Um, and the guys who were in charge had endless meetings and never decided anything. Simple things like who owned attack helicopters, land or air. So, and then we didn't we didn't resolve internal disputes early. I mean, there were things like, what does is dead mean? What does is active? Um, in the sensor world, on the in the platform domain, these things just never got resolved. Meanwhile, the programmers were busy you know, writing code. So, and but there was a requirement to have peer code reviews, but that. Well, by the wayside early on. Um, DOD never went to bat for us against the services, so we had no mentor. And the services, like most bureaucracies, just outweighed the political civilian leadership and got what they wanted. Um, nobody ever held the services' feet to the fire by saying, you're going to use us, or we're going to take away your money. You know, that's the only thing they understand. And our first director forbade the civilian managers from promoting it to outside people because he considered it a research project. Okay, now to the good stuff, small talk stuff. Um, small talk was, was kind of chosen primarily because the, 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 this was before Java really got going in, in 1997 because it had a VM and the VM was sold as a way to have the have the model run I think originally on six different platforms including things like silicon graphics which they haven't made for like 20 years but this was a big this was a big selling point uh, for us we made extensive use of blocks and a reification of code which I'll talk talk about later and we just could not have done it with uh, with with Java and um, so modeling is you know 
about figuring out what to leave in and what to leave out because we had a runtime constraint. We had we were required to run uh, 1,000 to 1 real time, which means you had to simulate 24 hours of real time in about 90 seconds. So you can't be fooling around putting extra crap in there. For instance, satellites didn't really fly because we weren't playing anti-satellite weapons. So they, didn't have to have, they didn't have to have a signature and you didn't have to have sensors to shoot them down, so we just didn't do it. And then again, um, a lot of modeling and simulation, like, like a lot of um, you know, application development, is you go down the wrong road before you find the right road. And with you know, the greatest thing about small talk is the cost of changing your mind is really low compared to other languages. Because you haven't nailed your feet to the floor with um, st static types and a whole bunch of code you have to throw away. OK, this was kind of cool. <laughs> Overlays. So basically, we would. Uh, distribute JWARS to certain classified sites. And so we had to, we had to go through this um, long and elaborate certification process to, to get it out to the door, and then the sites had to accept it. So if we had small errors or these people wanted um, changes quickly, it was difficult to do. So uh, who was it? It was Harvey came up with the idea of overlays. So the idea of, of, of was an overlay is that you would, st you would store small talk methods in the scenario data. And when the scenario stood up, it would read this, th these methods and it would replace them in the running image. So for instance, normally if you asked what the weather is, you would say target weather band. It would return an integer between one and six. Well, you can make an overlay saying, I want weather band to be two. You'd put this in the scenario data. <laughs> the cool thing was, well, this is the uncool thing was, your user would come say, this isn't working. You get in the debugger, duh, 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 no source code. And you go, that's an overlay because it wasn't there anymore. Anyway, they were they were pretty uh, they were pretty they were very popular. Okay. So during the one year period where there was no real JWARS office, we had one user, a bright woman, but not really a programmer. She wrote something with almost 500 overlays. So when we got this back, one of our tasks was to find out well which of the overlays are in the code and which are just overlays. So we we're trying to figure out how to how to compare this. You can't just do source code comparison because you know if you have blank lines, this doesn't work. And so I I remember this vividly. I was sitting in the shower one morning. I go byte codes. We'll compare the byte codes. The answer. And so we managed to incorporate the ones that weren't in there already. Okay. So they were pretty cool. <clears throat> We had a knowledge base, which uh, Vlad Deegan was instrumental in, in, in writing. And uh, <coughs> so you could actually write rules. And so for, for instance, you could write a, a rule to say, you know, when do you achieve air superiority? So if you, if you say you would write a, a method, perceived enemy fighter strength, and if you say if the return from that method was less than 50%, then air superiority would, air superiority would be true. And air superiority is one of those things in a model that certain things will happen afterwards. I mean, you can fly all over. You can fly anywhere if you own the air, and you can do a lot of damage. Until then, you got to continue to try to suppress the enemy air defenses. This was um, the users loved this because they could they could chain it, have dependencies, and it made modeling complex operations um, easier. And they weren't, and it wasn't it wasn't a, a static chaining. It would happen based upon. How these, how the simulation ran, how the dice were rolled. It was, it was pretty cool. Okay. So, um, JWARS used a simple uh, client server architecture. So we had this thing called the JAX, which would run on a machine, and it was the JWARS administrative control control system, and it would know about. Um, certain machines that were available to run simulations. So I, as a user, would log on and say, I want to run 30 reps of you know, Sea Viking. And I would tell Jax this, and he'd go find 30 machines, and he would you know, parcel this stuff out and run it, and then tell me where the, where the, uh, what the results were. We had uh, two high-performance computing centers, one in Charleston and the other in Aberdeen. But security made it hard for us to get new images out there, as I, I uh, discussed before. So what we, this is kind of what it looks like. So I'd be sitting up here, 
in Crystal City. And the jacks would be down here. And this would be the program files directory of the, of the Charleston machine. Okay, well, one time we modified the jacks. We, 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 mod we, we modified the jacks to be able to, you could, you could start at the JWORS development image in such a way that you could inspect this JAX object that's running down in Charleston. Okay, so at a certain point, we taught this JAX object how to do something like receive data, write to file. So I would be up in Arlington and I'd say, <laughs> to the, I'd open up an inspector in Smalltalk on the JAX, which is down in Charleston, and I would execute this method and it would push a scenario down to Charleston. And my boss kind of knew about this and he kind of looked the other way, but, because I asked the guys in Charleston, I said, is this program files directory ours to write in? Can we write it? And he said, yeah, so we weren't violating security. That was cool. Oh, this, just, yeah, we would add, yeah, we added this, actually we added this as an overlay to the jacks. We didn't even change the jacks. So I would stand up a development image with a GUI. I would inspect this jacks and I would, here's, what, here's the file transfer that I'd do. It was awesome. Okay. Funny JWORS errors. So, a transporter unit, which is like a tank truck, was, had orders to stay 30 kilometers in the rear of his headquarters. Well, his headquarters turned around and retreated. So, so the transporter dutifully moved into en enemy territory because that's where 30 kilometers back of him was. This was, this was interesting because the transporter sensors re reported a, scon a scud launch, which was the first time we'd ever gotten sensors to work. This was a big deal because we worked on sensors forever to get them to work. And then there's the famous cruise missiles that you heard about this, this morning. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so new air code, all the planes stopped working. And so we, we dug around, we found that Red had attacked all the air bases with chemical weapons before the war started and killed everybody. <laughs> and then an aircraft carrier was improperly initialized so that it, it ignored orders to stop when it sensed mines, hit a mine and sank, but it didn't tell the air boss who was the guy who conducted flight ops, so he continued to you know, plan air missions, but they couldn't go because the underlying platform was dead. Uh, okay. I don't know why. I just don't know why. I mean, who worked on that stuff? So, <laughs> this is a good one. We forgot to turn off, uh, turn on aircraft series until after the plane took off. So the plane is sitting on deck. It's got its sensors on. It takes off the deck on full afterburner, runs out of fuel before it gets there. <laughs> uh, this is kind of like cruise, cruise missiles, but uh, the standoff range, which is the range from the target that the B-52 launches its cruise missiles was wrong, so they fly up real short and get shot down. <laughs> uh, and then the airborne troops, which were ground forces, <laughs> would it, were in an aircraft and they started shooting at ground forces on the ground because they were both in the same ground sensor grid. <laughs> this, this, was, this was mine. I, I initially modeled, I've told this story before, I initially modeled uh, a subclass air code again to for satellites and the satellites would not fly and so digging the air code i found out that i had forgotten to give the satellites a, a com package so they were not able to call to call air traffic control and get permission to take off that was the end of subclassy air code i'll tell you i won't name the person who uh, did that okay back up slides so this just talks about the different managers who that uh, were called to decide things. So you'd have an adjudication manager. So you would uh, call the adjudication manager and uh, you'd say, I'm the attacker, I'm attacking this guy with this kind of weapon. And you'd roll the dice, you get a probability of kill, and then you'd find out you know, what happened. It would take into account line of sight and things like that. Uh, spatial manager, I think we had uh, three layers. You want to have a... Um, a detailed layer over here in layer, layer three for slow moving things like tanks and trucks, you want to have a, a large area for fast movers up here. So you had layers and they'd live in different layers. This stuff took 
a, a lot of time to develop, but it was it was really uh, it was good. The movement manager, uh, you would you would tell a BSE um, move from here to here at this speed, and the movement manager would take care of of moving you along the route at that speed, such that if you were attacked anywhere along that route, it would know where you are. It, so it wasn't just like at hour one, you were here, and at hour two, you were here instantaneously. It would move you along at the speed. Uh, the interaction manager was basically said, um, you know, do you see each other? We used, the sensors were pretty much circles because it's very easy to tell when two circles intersect. Uh, other shapes, not so much. It's more expensive computationally and circles were good enough. So basically sensors, all sensors had, or, Sensors had a radius and BSE, BSEs had a radius. And so for, for aircraft, they'd have like a radar cross section. So a stealth aircraft would have a very small radar cross section, which makes it more difficult to, to detect. Uh, we had an environment manager. They said weather, you play, we, played cra we played clouds, sand, all kinds of stuff. The event manager, okay, um, some, some models um, have fixed time steps, like every minute. JWARS was, an, was basically an event model. You might have, you know, 10 minutes go by where nothing happened, then you'd have a whole bunch of events. So basically you would stick events on the queue, whether it's a sensing event or a movement event, and the event manager would pick these things off and execute them. It's really the best, I think the best way to do a, to do a model. Now the heart of the heart of uh, JWORS or JAZZ was data collection. We had a um, we had a video playback model, but it was pretty it was pretty um, it wasn't all that useful for analysis. It was useful for seeing oh yeah the aircraft carrier went right across Hawaii. That's not right. But most of most of the, most of the JWORS analysis was what do we have like a couple hundred instruments. They'd be thinking like we'd have a killer victim scoreboard. We'd have things like how much you know how much gas, how much bullets did you use. Um, Things like that. So, when you when an analyst would run a scenario, he would <coughs> he would specify what instruments he wanted to have collected, and this stuff was stored in Oracle. We we used Oracle as really just a data repository. When we started the scenario, we tried to suck in about 300 megabytes of scenario data as quickly as we could, and while the thing while the thing was running, we would write out the Oracle data as quickly as we could. We did no exception handling. If it didn't happen, that was too bad. We were busy. So at the end of the run, you would take this data and you could export it to Excel or wherever, and it's and it's this data that the guys would look at to to to, to see what happened. And then the simulation manager is so just the guy who says, um, "I'm in charge of all these things." And should you want one of these fine small shot talk shirts, my friend Regina Cassidy at it takes a stitch.com will make you one. Questions? No, that wasn't us. That was somebody else. Yeah, it was you you tell the story. You might remember it better than I do. Was it? Yeah, it was Australia. Uh, they were doing some um, simulations, and apparently they used ground troops as a model for kangaroos. And as I recall the story, when uh, the uh, aircraft came over, the kangaroos pulled their guns and started shooting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bazooka, that was it. Yeah. Where was that from? Yeah, another another model that was. Uh, that was uh, yeah, it was. It wasn't us. Yeah. yeah not it, <laughs> I should say uh, one more thing that after the uh, initial contract for JWARS was let, there was a competition between a team building a prototype in VisualWorks Smalltalk and uh, C++. And the, and the Smalltalk team just blew the doors off the C++ group. They were, had much, much more done in a year. I don't not know why they went from VisualWorks to VisualAge at the end, but... Uh, yeah, there was <laughs> Simulation for a little while, and then 
right as an adjudication was about to happen, it would halt and pass to an actual guy in a flight sim. He would fly the mission along with some other people, and then it would take that output and roll it into the model and continue yep. the model. Yeah, we we did have, um, and we also had pause, modify, resume, where you could you you could do just what you could, you could stick a man loop at a certain point and and have him do something and then put it back. Obviously, that's a difficult problem because you know you, if you start moving a BSC around, well, what happens to the things that are sensing it? And it, it's it's kind of complicated. But that was one of the goals. You're right, is to interface with these other models. The other thing they wanted to do is let's say you get you get you know you get 24 hours into the war. And you want to ask a bunch of guys sitting around, what would you, you know, okay, now what would you like to have, do differently? So the idea was to allow you to put a different course of action in there to, to, try, to try to change the outcome. But we, we, didn't get that, we didn't get that far. But it was, it was a fine model. And, and I'll tell you one more story. One afternoon, Keith got a, got a call and he said, can you stick the F-22 in there for the for the F-18 and see what difference it made? And in three hours, he had his answer. He had he had did three runs, and that made a significant. And all he had to do was go in there, take out the F-18, put in the F-22 as a new BSE, run the thing, bang, he was done. It was it was really um, dead simple. Yeah. This this is still uh, well. A friend of mine is still trying to drag this out of DoD. There are, there are civilian people who want to use it, but DoD has given him an incredible runaround. And it's it's government software. All all they got to do is get a bunch of people to sign up. But there's still a lot of people in DoD who hate JWARS. Hate it. Yeah, you you could sell this too with tra Transcom. Was that the big? Uh, yeah, the Transportation Command. We had a huge logistics piece. We was that when you know one one of the things about if you're going to fight a war, you got to get all your crap over there. And for us, you know, it's like takes takes six months for, for us to get all our stuff over to Iraq. But once it happens, we're going to win. So if you want to fight the U.S. USA, fight them right now with what we got. And that's 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 exactly right. So logistics was, was a big part. But for some reason, they 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 didn't seem to play the logistics as much. But we had uh, we had we had in theater. Logistics and log logistics from CONUS or Continental U.S. over, you know, so it would play that kind of stuff. But yeah, there were a lot, a lot of things that it could have been used for, but you know, politics mostly. I find that uh, this is a common feature of many uh, projects is that they're so hated within the organization that they belong to. Uh, well, it, it wasn't really hated within the organization; it was hated by. Um, by other by users from the other services. I mean, it was so bad that there was they were doing one project at OSD Cape, and they were using several models. and the And the guys from the services we're, we're just not going to consider the results of, of JWARS. We're not going to do it. And nobody told them no. You know, it's just like, nobody ever kicked their ass, so they got away with it. And I think a lot of it was they they didn't know how to fiddle it because some of the stuff that goes on in the other models. I mean, they'd say, okay, in this area. You know, the probability of sub submarine detection is 0.4, always. Well, no, no, it isn't. Or you're always going to have, you know, this this kind of, you're always going to have this probability of kill. Well, no, you're not. They wanted something that gave the results they wanted. That's exactly right. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one more story. And Seth knows this guy, Dave. <laughs> Dave was Dave was at JWORS for a couple of years. He, said, he, told, he tells Ron, he says, you know, Ron, I'm going to go over to da 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 because they're really doing some cutting edge stuff. And Ron said, you know, Dave, you go over there. They're going to give you the answer before you do the study. Dave went anyway. Dave came back in a year and goes, Ron, you're right. So that's true in a lot of places. I mean, you don't hire a PR firm to give you the wrong answer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, yeah. Right. So, but it was a good model. It, it it was an honest model. It it did a lot of a lot of cool stuff. It ran. It uh, it was really and it was a hell of a lot of fun too. So, any other questions? Yeah. yeah so you were describing a lot what is what not. <laughs> Are you aware of any <coughs> impact of the system? Real impact. 
Well, I, that, that was kind of above my pay grade. The only one I, I know where they, is this like the F-22 F versus the F-18 um, thing that he was asked to do. There were a lot of studies done with JWARS. I do not know what, what the outcomes of the analysis was. Um, I guess I could have asked. I, I was busy. <laughs> so, but um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if you bring that back, uh, that um, little sheet. If you, oh, okay, everybody see it? All right, well, thank you.